And then if I'm gonna use something that I actually have to rig, it's gonna be weightless and weedless on a three aught, four aught, or five aught hook that looks just like this. I like owner hooks. They're a thick wire, they really sharp point, but Kamigatsu, Eagle. Well, hello and welcome to Outdoor Oklahoma. I'm Todd Craighead. For several decades, the wildlife department has hosted fishing clinics all across the state. But as our world has changed around us, we in turn have had to learn to adapt and grow in response. So a new era of additional fishing clinics are now offered virtually. They're still conducted live by our fishing coordinator, but we're able now to reach a whole new audience. These Ask an Angler virtual fishing courses are not intended to replace the traditional in-person clinics like at a city park pond, but it offers us an opportunity to go more in depth with certain subjects. So if you're wanting to get, say, into the weeds, well, things like pre-spawn bass tips, or maybe winter pond fishing techniques, or crappie fishing tips. These virtual classes are perfect. You can either watch them live or find them on our Outdoor Oklahoma YouTube channel. A wildlife department that adapts its ways of communication to help make you the most educated and effective sportsman you can be. Just another reason to love Oklahoma and the adventures that await you. Well, it's been a while since our last catfishing episode, and I know there's a lot of you out there who really enjoy bank fishing for catfish just as much as I do, so we're gonna give it another try today. In our first episode, we focused on points that jut out into lakes. That's one of my favorite spots to fish, especially if there's been a, a headwind or a, a flanking headwind blowing into that point, sometimes very productive for catfish and lakes. The next episode, we just fished an old mud flat. Many of our lakes here in Oklahoma have, especially on the upper end of the lakes, mud flats with basically no topography, no structure to speak of, no variation in depth, all the things you normally look for in a good catfishing spot. But those mud flats get really, really productive, especially in the springtime, particularly when the shad start spawning and you can really fill up a stringer sometimes. But we're gonna switch gears today a little bit and employ one of my favorite tactics for bank fishing for catfish, and that's fishing in running water after a flooding rain, which is what we've had here in the Texoma region. We've had a exceptionally dry spring. Today's the last day of April, but a couple of days ago, we finally got that big rain, over four inches in most of the basin of Texoma. And as you can see behind me here, the water's running. There's many creeks that run into Texoma. This is one in particular that's just starting to widen out into the lake, which is a place I really like to target when it's running. Still a lot of foam and debris coming down, there's a lot of rough fish in here, carp, buffalo, gar, drum. Hopefully we can wade through them and, and catch a couple of catfish because catfish love to nose up into fresh, muddy water. Now that's probably an oxymoron, but you know what I mean. When the flooding water comes down these creeks, it brings all types of nutrients and bait, all types of dead material washing down, and they basically go on a feeding frenzy. And hopefully we'll have some up in here looking to eat today. Now what I'm gonna use today and these are basically six foot Walmart specials. And I have old Ambassador 5000s on each of them. I bought them used off of eBay. And anyone in the know on catfishing reels knows that an old Ambassador 5000, especially the old Swedish models, are fantastic. One, maybe one of the best, if not the best overall catfishing reel. If you take even decent care of them, they can last you years and perhaps even decades. I've got them spooled up with Berkeley Trilene Big Game 30 pound test line so we can hold anything if we happen to get a hold of a big one today. And basically my setup is, is real simple, same as always. I got a four ounce bank sinker on the bottom. Up above that about a foot and a half. I'll tie a, a leader into my line, probably 10 inches, and then have a Eagle Claw wide bend laser sharp number four hook on that. I also always bring my favorite rod with me. It'll hopefully see some action at some point today. It's just a, 
a real limber medium action, again, Walmart six foot rod that I've got an old Shimano Calcutta with 20 pound Berkeley big game line on because, you know, I get a fish on that and it kind of harkens back to the cane pole days with all of the, the flexibility. So I always enjoy catching fish on that as well. Bait for today. Now in running water, almost any bait will work because they're out here looking for anything they can get a hold of to eat. Worms, crawdads, cut perch, chicken liver, shad, you name it. But my go-to bait is always fresh shad. And I was fortunate enough to catch some big gizzard shads a few days ago in my cast net. Now I'll mention something about shad too. The little shad don't last very long, a day or two, and they start getting soft and they won't stay on your hook very well. But I want you to know those big gizzard shad, if you'll take care of them, keep them relatively dry and packed in ice, they're good to go for a week and even more. In fact, the shad I have today, I've got cut up into chunks, but they're five days old. So we'll see how they work out. I also have some earthworms. Of course, that's a fantastic bait in running water. The earthworms I have, I actually grow myself. I had a old boy that was throwing away a chest type freezer. It was inoperable. And so he gave it to me for free. I bought a 50 pound bag of what's called Spangled Peat Moss from Walmart. I saturated that peat moss set it in the bottom of that chest freezer, probably about a foot deep, put my earthworms in there. They're called Georgia Browns. They're not as long as a night crawler, but they're real fishy worms. They'll definitely catch catfish if there's any around. And I feed them about once a week with chicken crumbles. It's basically chicken feet. You can get a 50 pound bag at a feed store for seven, eight dollars. And if you think about it, you can hardly buy two containers of night crawlers at the bait shop for, for that much money. So it's pretty economical. And I keep that chest freezer on the north side of my shop building so it doesn't get that direct hot sunlight during the summer. And they, they'll keep all year round and they'll reproduce in there. So you'll always have bait available when it's time to go fishing. And lastly, I've got some grub worms. Just white grubs, beetle grubs. I don't use them very often because I don't find them, quite frankly, very often. But funny story, a couple of days ago, we was having one of those big deluges of rain. And I looked outside, I have a dog, it's a shepherd mix named Shep, real original I know, but he was a rescue dog. And I saw him eating stuff off of the ground, running here and there. I didn't have any idea what he was doing. So I went out there to take a look and those grub worms were coming up out of that wet ground to get out of the, the water. And he was picking them off one by one and swallowing them down kind of like a great blue heron swallowing a perch or something. I didn't know dogs would eat grub worms, but this one will. Maybe he's watched too many episodes of Naked and Afraid, I'm not sure, but I was able to get ahead of him and get me about a dozen. So we'll put grub worm on one of these poles and see if it'll produce. Grub worm was always one of my dad's favorite fishing baits. And my dad and I, this time of year in April, would always take a week, I would take off work. We would fish all week, every day, bank fishing for catfish. We did that for decades and he passed away uh, last day of November in 2020 died of COVID-19 actually and so I'm gonna dedicate this day to him because I know he would love to be here today now he lived a, a, a long life he was just two weeks shy of 95 years old healthy the whole time uh, World War II Battle of the Bulge Vet so he had a full life and he's gone on to his reward so that's a good thing but uh, we'll dedicate this day to him but enough talking, we're going to get these baited out and tossed in and see if we can get a rod to bend. We'll, uh, we'll put a piece of cut shad on this first one here. And I've cut these shad up. They come off of a, a big shad. I just fillet them off of the shad and then cut them into, oh, probably two inch strips that are probably a half inch wide. Now the thing to remember is you want to have plenty of your hook exposed after you put this chunk of shad on there. So just come down probably an eighth to a quarter of an inch below the top of the cut bait. Bring it through. Make sure any scales that were on the barb or the tip of the hook are removed. So you have that sharp hook and your barb available. And that's the good thing about these wide bend hooks. You have plenty of, of hook remaining because that's a big bait and you don't want to get the bait over the point of your hook or you'll lose the hook set every time. Put that one right out by that floating debris out there. That's always a little bit of structure. 
even in running water, I like to target it. We're going to put a grub worm on this hook. It's one of those big white grubs I was talking to you about earlier. Now, one thing I will do with these, they've got a natural bend in them. And if you bring the hook through that natural bend, sometimes that worm will be in the way of your point. So what I'll do is come behind the head there, the opposite direction of the bend, cast that out and see if something's interested in a grub today. Put some earthworms on this one. These are those little Georgia brown worms that I was telling you about earlier. They're not big, but they're active. And I don't think there's any proper way to hook worms on. I know have a way I do it. I like to leave as much of the worm wiggling off of the hook as possible. So I'll basically grab about, I'll come down from one end of the worm just a few millimeters, bring the point of the hook through, oh, maybe a quarter inch, bring it back out, fold the worm over, do that again, and then come back out of the worm before I reach his other tip. So you have all of those worm tips floundering around out in the water. I think that's a good thing. I like a full hook of worms, as long as I've got plenty of the end of the hook exposed, the tip of the hook. That'll do it. I saw those earthworm. First fish of the day. She's coming to her milk. Nice one. That's what it's all about. Fish on on the little pole. That one hit a piece of that shad. We got here another blue cat. Now that's the kind of action we like to see right there. He's talking to us. He's loquacious. As Carl from Sling Blade might say, I like the way you talk. Mm. Anyway, this is a blue cat. Of course, they're generally lighter than color in color than a channel cat. But the uh, best way to identify them, because sometimes in certain water turbidities, they look kind of similar, especially a, a bull-headed channel cat can resemble a, a blue cat out of clearer water. On the anal fin here, a blue cat is blunt, straight across, B and B. A channel cat is curved, C and C. That's how I always remember them. But yeah, that's a, that's a pretty Lake Texoma blue cat right there. Really good eating size. I figure that fish will weigh four pounds maybe. That one's gonna weigh about seven and a half pounds. He's fat meaty, make some fine fillets. Well, right on time, there's a little channel cat. We can take a look at it and the difference between it and a blue cat. Oh, he's talking to two. Now these channel cat are usually golden colored, of course, and a lot of times we'll have some spots or speckles on them. But again, that anal fin down at the bottom, you'll see that it's got a curve to it. Unlike a, a blue cat, that'll be blunt straight across. So channel curve, blue cat blunt. And normally you can tell just at a glance by their color and so forth, but occasionally they look 
fairly similar and that's the, the best way to scientifically tell the difference. But we'll let him grow a little bit. Helen. Yeah. Tell you what, I take those all day long, twice on Sunday. Really nice eating size channel cat. Doesn't have to be worms. I think I'm gonna string him up. I don't know what the bite force is on these channel cat, but it's up there. Well, we've already got enough for supper. It's just bonus from here on out. There we go. Yeah, we'll uh, weigh that one up. That's just a, a fantastic blue cat. I love fishing this running water. Yeah, he's gonna clear 12. It's always from the tip of the snout to the end of one of the forks in the tail. 30 and one quarter, so we've got our 30 inch fish for the day. 12 and 12, 12 and a half pounds. That's what it's all about. We'll dedicate that one to my dad, Marvin Banner, right there. He would, he'd have a smile a mile long to catch fish like that. I enjoy all types of fishing, I really do. Anything that's biting, I like to be there attempting to catch it, but there is something special about catfishing to me. You know, when you can set your poles out on a beautiful day like today, sit back and relax, and you know, watch you getting a bite right now, and let the fish come to you. I like that more passive type of fishing. It's, to me, it's more relaxing, and I think that's why I give it the edge over other types of, of fishing from the bank. Kind of tricky. Well, this water's clear. Sure is. Ah, uh, that's probably good. Take these life jackets off. Yeah, I figured we'd come over here and try to catch a few small fish, hopefully a big one. What depth of water are we gonna fish? Uh, we're gonna fish probably area from five to 12 feet of water. Yeah. What makes this so good down here? Well, I, I liked on this Carolina rig over this high driller. Seems to be a pretty good area. Are you throwing a ringworm? Throwing a Jane LaRue ringworm, yeah. Plum color. I'm gonna we'll fish this power lizard. Yeah. So hopefully we'll catch some fish. Okay. He don't look 14. Nah, I don't think he'll make it. It is a start though. He's out there in that channel, wasn't he? Yeah, just right off.
When did you catch that fish? I see that big fish. Caught the uh, 14 pound, 10 ounce state record fish March the 25th last year. Do you have that date like engraved? Yeah. Yeah. I don't blame you. Yeah, it's something I, may stick with me for a long time, I think. But you pretty much have come up here just looking for for more or larger fish and you don't fish much else, do you? I've pretty much during spawn season that uh, it's the only lake you'll find me on. And normally I'm fishing for big fish. You think there's another one in here bigger? I I feel like there probably is. Since then, I've caught a few big fish, but nothing really close to 14 pounds. You find that you fish differently just looking for big fish or use different baits or something like that? More so well, than you, you would if you're just you, out. You pay more attention to, to your line and your knots that you tie and really look for bad spots and things like that more than I really used to knowing that there is a possibility of catching a fish that big. There he is. It may lip that fish. Nah. I think, I think mine's a little bigger than yours. Yeah, I believe he was. I tell you what, he ate that lizard. Yeah, they're hitting it right on the fall there. Any bigger? Fish might be a little bit bigger than the last one, but no, not a whole lot. It's better. He ate that thing on the first cast. Get back on our trolling motor here. Yeah, that is all right. A little better fish. Swimming down. There's a bunch of fish on that point. Wind and hydrilla. <laughs> we may have to just call it a day. Go in, eat lunch or something, come back out later. All right. We've uh, had a pretty good day of, or a pretty good morning of fishing, should yeah. I say, anyway. Nothing big, but hey, at least they were biting. All right. So I'd say we'll go eat some dinner. Okay. Let's go. Well, we hope today's stories remind you that Oklahoma is such a perfect state to explore. So however you choose to enjoy our state's incredible natural world, remember that your adventure starts with Outdoor Oklahoma. Outdoor Oklahoma is produced by the Oklahoma Department of Wildlife Conservation and is proud to serve and be funded entirely by sportsmen and women and outdoor enthusiasts who love and appreciate all things wild in the great state of Oklahoma. <laughs>